Hello, this is Sally Anero from Taylor Wessing and welcome to our webinar. If you're expecting Vim Banj, uh, I'm standing in for him today, hence the slightly higher voice. Um, welcome everyone to our webinar. Today's webinar is part of our webinar program uh, where we will bring you our expertise. and views on topical data protection issues. Those of you who are regular attendees will be very familiar with some of our previous topics where we've included subjects like uh, managing cyber security risks, we've been looking at data transfers, uh, and technologies such as the use of CCTV and uh, the development of apps and privacy issues associated with that. And of course, we've been tracking the progress of the EU data protection regulation amongst many other subjects. If you are still interested in engaging in recordings of those webinars, you can find those on our global data hub website if you missed uh, those previous webinars and you want to uh, catch up on any of those topics. For those of you who are new to Taylor Wessing or new to our webinars, then welcome. As you'll see from the slide, Taylor Wessing is a leading international law firm. We act for a range of uh, clients in local and international markets providing a full service law firm offering from our office footprint that spans across Northern, Central and Eastern Europe, including also the Middle East and Asia. We've listed more details about the firm on the slide deck for your reference. Today's webinar is brought to you by Taylor Wessing's International Data Protection Practice. Our team advises on all aspects of data protection and information law from the office footprint that I mentioned earlier. We are a global 23 partner driven firm and we specialise in data protection and we're complemented by our international network of data privacy law specialists. Taylor Wessing, we have a dedicated microsite that's specifically for all things Taylor Wessing on data protection. Uh, and from that site, you can access our weekly news, our updates, and a fine monthly mail shot if you register for that. Uh, we also take a look at particular topical issues uh, that are raising concerns or issues or challenges on the privacy front, uh, and those appear um, uh, as they are, uh, on, on our uh, Global Data Hub site. Um, and from the Data Hub site, you can also access details of our forthcoming webinars, uh, as well as details of our recordings of archived webinars. As I mentioned, my name is Sally Anero, and I'm a senior member of the London Data Protection Practice. And today, we have several members of the uh, data protection team uh, with us, and uh, their profile information is available for you here. So, in today's webinar, we're going to be looking at compliance considerations for data processes. When the General Data Protection Regulation comes into force from the 25th of May 2018, it's going to herald for the first time some important direct obligations in the law uh, on data processes, and as well as um, a presenting a direct risk of exposure by uh, processes to enforcement and higher fines that the uh, data protection regulation provides for the breaches of the law, and also the potential for uh, affected subjects to bring claims directly against data processes. My colleague Debbie Hayward will be the first to approach this topic from the general perspective of the new direct obligations on processes under the regulation, uh, what these obligations are, and also the consequences for non-compliance. Marina is then going to be focusing on some specifics for the impact of the uh, general data protection regulation for those who are offering processing services in the cloud and uh, providing some recommendations for uh, Global, uh, sorry, general data protection regulation readiness or GDPR readiness for cloud service providers. And then following Morena, we have Thanos Ramos from our Munich office, which is one of five Taylor Wetting offices across Germany. Thanos will be looking at the current German experience of requirements relevant to processes 
where there are already some direct regulatory obligations that exist in the law, and you'll be considering the extent to which the, the General Data Protection Regulation, the GDPR, is going to be changing matters for Germany. And so with that, I'd like to step aside and introduce my colleague, Debbie Hayes. Thanks, Sally. Um, as Sally mentioned, one of the most significant changes brought in by the GDPR is that it places direct obligations on data processes, processes for the first time at EU level. Well, some countries have already had these, um, as that, or had similar sorts of obligations, as Thanos will explain. For the UK and for many other member states, this is new. And alongside these obligations comes the possibility of data subjects enforcing their rights directly against data processors and an enforcement regime which lays the non-compliant data processor open to sanctions, including potentially hefty fines. Data processors have a variety of business models, most significantly on-premises and cloud service providers. And as Sally said, my colleague Mirena will be looking at cloud service providers shortly. But it's important to understand that the provisions under the GDPR will be relevant to all data processors. Sorry, I'm losing my slides here. <laughs> so who, who is affected? Um, I'm going to start by looking at who's caught by the GDPR. Um, and to do that, we need to run through a few definitions used in the legislation. So firstly, what is a data processor? Well, a data processor is defined as a natural or legal person, a public authority, agency, or other body which processes personal data on behalf of the controller. So this is a familiar concept. You're processing personal data on behalf of somebody else who controls what's going on. Um, the controller is a natural or legal person, public authority, agency, or other body which alone or jointly with others determines the purposes and means of processing of personal data. So again, you're looking at really considering at who's got control of the data, who decides what is being processed, why it's being processed, and where it's being processed. Um, we also need to look at who falls within the scope of the GDPR. And to do that, we need to look at Article 3. And that states that the GDPR applies to the processing of personal data in the context of the activities of an establishment of a controller or processor in the union, whether or not the processing takes place in the union, and also to the processing of personal data of data subjects who are in the union by a controller or processor who is not in the union, where the processing relates to the offering of goods or services, whether they're free or paid for, or the monitoring of behavior which takes place within the EU. Now, as we discussed in our, our last webinar, this formally extends the scope of the GDPR. So we're talking about um, processing which is carried out in the union, but also processing which is carried out around uh, you, data subjects who are in the union. So what are the main obligations on data processes under the GDPR? If you fall within the scope of the GDPR as a data processor, you've got a number of key compliance points, and the majority of these are in Articles 28 to 37 of the GDPR. The first point is that processing, the processing has to meet the requirements of the regulation. Data controllers may only appoint data processors which provide sufficient guarantees to implement appropriate technical and organizational me me measures to ensure processing meets the requirements of the GDPR. Processors are required to process personal data in accordance with the controller's instructions. Now, this is very broad brush, and it could be said that it imposes an indirect obligation to comply with many of the requirements which actually apply to controllers, albeit at the instruction of the controllers. And it's likely that this general requirement will be made specific in the relevant controller processor contract, and it's certainly in the interests of both the controllers and processors to make sure that obligations are set out as clearly as possible. Another new element for many member states under the GDPR will be are the restrictions on subcontracting. The GDPR gives data controllers a wide degree of control in terms of the ability of the processor to subcontract. In effect, data processors require prior written consent to subcontract. This can be general, but even where general consent has been given, the processor still has to inform the controller of any new subprocessors, giving the controller time to object. The lead processor is required to reflect the same contractual obligations it has with the controller in a contract with any sub-processors and remains liable to the controller for the actions or inactions of any sub-processor. 
Now, the savvy data controller may already be insisting on these requirements under their contracts with data processors, but many will probably also have been content with keeping the primary processor on the hook for any actions or inactions by their subprocessors, preferring not to get too involved with who they are. The new requirements around subcontracting data processing will add a layer of formality to these arrangements. Data processor activities will have to be governed by a binding contract with regard to the controller. There's also scope for a contract to be replaced with member state or union law. The binding obligations on the processor have to cover the duration, nature and purpose of the processing, the types of data processed and the obligations and rights of the controller. There are a number of specific requirements, including that the personal data is processed only on documented instructions from the controller and requirements to insist the controller in comply with many of its obligations under the GDPR. The data processor has an obligation to tell the controller if it believes an instruction to hand information to the data controller breaches the GDPR or any other EU or member state law. Again, some of these requirements do little more than formalise good practice, but the last element, the obligation to inform the data controller if a processor believes an instruction to hand over information breaches the GDPR or any other EU or member state law, places a considerable burden on the processor who's not necessarily been used to considering this issue. One of the threads which runs through the GDPR is the requirement to demonstrate compliance. Processors are under an obligation to maintain a record of all categories of processing activities. This must include details of the controllers and any other processors, and of any relevant data protection officers or DPOs, the categories of processing carried out, details of any transfers to third countries, and general description of technical and organisational security measures, and these records must be available to be provided to the relevant supervisory authority on their request. There is a carve-out to these obligations where the processor has fewer than 250 employees, provided the processing does not pose a risk to the rights and freedoms of individuals, is not more than occasional and does not include special data or what's currently known as sensitive personal data. Processors, like controllers, are required to implement appropriate security measures. What is appropriate is assessed in terms of a variety of factors, including the sensitivity of the data, the risk to individuals associated with any security breach, the state of the art, the cost of implementation, and the nature of the processing. And these measures might include pseudonymization and encryption. Regular testing of the effectiveness of any security measures is also required where appropriate. Now, in terms of breach notification requirements, the enhanced breach notification requirements on both data controllers and data processors have been causing concern to stakeholders since the first draft of the GDPR was published. While the obligations on controllers have been slightly reined in over the subsequent drafts, processors are still required to notify their relevant controller of any breach without undue delay after becoming aware of it. And this is one of the areas where the GDPR is annoyingly vague. While it's arguably better for processors not to be bound to specific timeframes as controllers are, it's hard to ignore the prospect of disputes between controllers and processors as to when delay might be undue. And this is an area which might benefit from being dealt with in more detail in controller processor contracts. The concept of a mandatory DPO is not new in all EU jurisdictions, but it is new to the UK. Both controllers and processors are required to appoint DPOs in certain situations including where they are a public authority or body, where the data processing activities require regular monitoring of data subjects on a large scale, or where the core activities of the processing involve large amounts of special or sensitive data, or data relating to criminal convictions and offences. The DPO must have a degree of independence and is the contact point for any data subject and for the supervisory authority. The primary role of the DPO is to assist the processor with and advise on compliance with the GDPR. Processors may also choose to appoint a DPO even if they do not fall into one of the specified categories, or they may be required to do so under member state law. If a DPO is appointed, contact details for the DPO must be published and communicated to the supervisory authority. Now, we, over the last few months, we've seen transfers to third countries become an extremely hot topic. Under the GDPR, the processor has to exercise a degree of independence from the controller when deciding whether or not it can transfer personal data to a third country. And this is another significant departure which requires the processor to be much more proactive than under the current regime. 
While processors are required to follow the relevant data controller's instructions with regards to data processing, no matter what those instructions are, they may only transfer personal data to a third country in the absence of an adequacy decision if the controller or processor has provided appropriate safeguards and on condition that data subjects have enforceable rights in that country with respect to data. Again, this is an area which should be clarified in controller processor contracts. Appropriate safeguards may be provided in a number of ways, including in the form of binding corporate rules, model contract clauses, or a legally binding instrument between public authorities. The GDPR also introduces uh, codes of conduct as a means both to impose additional obligations on processors and for them to demonstrate compliance. Associations or bodies may submit codes of conduct for approval by member states or at commission level. Certification or seal programs may also be used to demonstrate compliance with GDPR requirements. And this introduces the potential for different standards across different industries and between member states. So we'll have to wait and see how widely used they become and how useful they are. The crucial question for data processors is what happens if we don't comply? Under current law, data processors are subject to liability for failure to comply with their contractual obligations to their controllers. They have not, however, previously been open to direct action by regulators or by data subjects, and this all changes under the GDPR. Data subjects will be able to take action against processors and claim damages where they have su suffered material or immaterial damage as a result of an infringement of the processor obligations under the GDPR. In addition, data subjects can enforce directly against processors who have breached any lawful instructions by the controller. So potentially, processors will be liable both to the controller and to data subjects for the same breach, although there is a mechanism for apportionment of responsibility between controller and processor with respect to data subjects. As well as damages claims from data controllers and data subjects, non-compliant data processors are also vulnerable to sanctions by the regulator. These range from access and audit rights to administrative orders and ultimately to fines of up to 4% of annual global turnover for certain breaches. So what's next for data processors? The greatly increased account accountability of data processors under the GDPR means that the controller processor contract becomes even more important to the data processor. Under current law, it's arguably the data controller which has greater interest in covering off its potential liability by signing the processor up to specific obligations. Going forward, however, the processor has as much of an interest in making sure obligations are precisely defined as the controller because it's so much more exposed. We're now at the start of a two-year period before the GDPR applies, so data processors should be thinking about reviewing their existing contracts with their data controllers, reviewing their use of subcontractors, reviewing their data export arrangements, considering whether they need, or need to or should appoint a DPO, reviewing their data security arrangements, setting up compliance accountability procedures, and conducting risk assessments to ascertain what form appropriate and organizational technical measures will take. I'm now going to hand you to my colleague Mirena, who's going to look in more detail at the use of personal data by cloud service providers. Thanks, Debbie. Actually, before Mirena uh, starts focusing on some of the cloud issues, um, I'm conscious that there's quite a lot of uh, detail uh, around the new obligations that processors uh, uh, are going to acquire under the regulation. Um, and uh, to the extent that you've got any questions, either on what Debbie has been covering, or indeed uh, on the subsequent speakers, Marina and Thanos, uh, you can uh, flag a question with us using the Q&A button on, uh, on the screen in front of you uh, at any point, and we will try and uh, pick up on as many of those questions that we have time for uh, uh, during the webinar, or alternatively, we will follow up uh, at a later stage uh, which can provide the contact details. So. Uh, uh, with that, uh, just a reminder about the Q&A feature, I will pass over to Marina. Thank you very much, Sally. Uh, first, I would like to explain why we have decided to talk about the cloud today in the first place. Um, actually, this is a very hot topic. According to the International Data Corporation Worldwide Quarterly Cloud IT Infrastructure Tracker, Vendor revenue from sales of infrastructure products for cloud IT, including public and private cloud, grew 21.9% year over year to $29 billion in 2015, 
with vendor revenue for the fourth quarter growing 15.7% to $8.2 billion. Compared to overall IT infrastructure spending, the share of cloud IT infrastructure sales climbed to 32.2% in the fourth quarter of 2015, up from 28.6% a year ago. Revenue from infrastructure sales to private cloud grew by 17.5% to $3.3 billion and to public cloud by 14.6% to $4.9 billion. In comparison, revenues in the traditional non-cloud IT infrastructure segment decreased 2.7% year over year in the fourth quarter. The cloud will speed up the rollout of services on a scale, which was not possible with traditional technology solutions. It promises flexibility and efficiency, and we also should not underestimate that the cloud services offer an affordable route for smaller organizations to cope with rapid expansions. There's new innovative and successful vendors that are emerging, but traditional big vendors are also investing significant amount of, in developing and acquiring demand solutions. Of course, we need to mention certain privacy concerns. And if, of course, I will provide you some additional tips for cloud service providers in preparing for the GDPR. Since the cloud providers have multiple users, all using a slice of the same infrastructure, they are able to provide a high level of protection and functionality at a reasonable price. Otherwise, dealing with vulnerabilities in networks, operating systems, and applications would be a full-time job for organizations, not to mention an expensive exercise. On the other hand, migrating on-premise application to the cloud lead to various risks, including personal data falling into the wrong hands. Hackers see this as an opportunity to steal private information nowadays. Another issue that must be mentioned is the data location issue. A cloud provider may, without notice to a user, move the user's information from one jurisdiction to another or even subcontracting the cloud services. This becomes an issue if the host country does not adequate, doesn't have an adequate laws to protect personal data or if the host nation depends largely on the government. The use of non-flexible standard terms of use also represents an issue, which we will discuss later. Taking into consideration that the responsibilities of the data processors increase under the GDPR, as Debbie mentioned before, it is important to stress that it is a responsibility of both service providers and end customers to ensure that data is secure within the cloud. Both parties must understand their roles and responsibilities in this respect, and this, what I would like, this is what I would like to do today. I would like to help the cloud providers to understand their responsibilities, and even though we will have an additional information and guidance how the data would be used under the GDPR, this might be useful for, for all of you. So what are the recent developments? The benefit of cloud computing services has been recognized at the European level. The European Cloud Initiative is among the 16 initiatives of the Digital Single Market Strategy, which have been adopted on 6th of May 2015. It has been estimated that the European Cloud Initiative could have the potential to add a total of 449 billion euros to the 28 member states, of which 103 billion euros in the year 2020. Further, between 2015 and 2020, approximately 303,000 new businesses could be created, particularly small and medium enterprises, thanks to the availability and adoption of cloud-based computing. Approximately a year later, on 17 of May 2016, the Council formally adopted a directive concerning measures for a high common level of security of network and information systems across the European Union, which must still be approved by the European Parliament at second reading and is expected to enter into force in August 2016. This directive introduces various requirements, but we are mentioning it here due to the detailed definition of cloud computing services. According to that directive, cloud services are services 
that allow access to scalable and elastic pool of shareable computing resources. I would like you to pay attention on scalable, on elastic pool, and on shareable. Those computing resources include resources such as networks, servers, or other infrastructure, storage, applications, and services. The term scalable refers to computing resources that are flexibly allocated by the cloud service provider irrespective of the geographical location of the resources in order to handle fluctuations in demand. The term elastic pool is used to describe those computing resources that are provisioned and released according to demand in order to rapidly increase and decrease resources available depending on workload. And the term shareable is used to describe those computing resources that are provided to multiple users who share a common access to the service but where the processing is carried out separately for each user, although the service is provided from the same electronic equipment. Debbie and Sally already mentioned the GDPR. The GDPR should be taken seriously. It is the biggest transformation of the EU data protection law in the last 20 years, and as you already know, it would apply from 25th of May 2018. Cloud computing services will be significantly affected by the rigorous new European data protection rules. Under the current European data protection law, Cloud providers which act as data processors by processing personal data on behalf of their customers and under their instructions have few direct responsibilities. The GDPR, however, introduces various direct obligations on processors of personal data together with hefty fines for non-compliance. And now I would like that you're expecting the top tips for cloud service providers on preparing for the GDPR. As I have mentioned earlier, we still expecting detailed guidance, but I hope that this would help you to uh, use these tips and in implement the GDPR uh, from now on. First tip, be the right cloud provider. Many cloud providers use standard terms of use. It would be very difficult to use such standard documentation if you provide services to clients from various industries. However, it would be easier to achieve this goal if the cloud services are designed for specific processing rather than one which could be adapted. Another tip is to process personal data only for purposes you have initially agreed upon with your cloud customer. If you want to use the personal data for other purposes, make sure that you have a valid ground for such processing. For example, you can use consent. Many cloud providers reserve their right to use personal data for various purposes which have not been agreed with their customer. This is a bad practice. This is especially common in the cases where the cloud services are offered for free. If for any reason you determine the purposes and the means of use of personal data, you be, would be considered the controller under the GDPR in relation to that data and in which case the processing will have to comply with the relevant legal requirements imposed by the GDPR on data controllers. Initiating such personal data processing may lead to additional complications and risks and potentially to infringement of the GDPR due to a lack of proper grounds for the processing of the personal data. The cloud providers must know that they should provide reasonable terms of use. You have to make sure that all GDPR legal requirements concerning the controller-processor relationship have been taken into consideration if you decide to offer standard terms, terms of use to your customers. Under the GDPR, the controller, meaning the cloud customer, must have an agreement with the processor, the cloud provider, for processing of personal data. The GDPR envisages various legal requirements that must be stipulated in these agreements and the customers will look for such requirements. The cloud customer wants to ensure compliance with such requirements prior to engaging the cloud provider to carry out data processing. At this stage, many cloud providers have standard terms of use which either may not be negotiated or allow only minor changes. You must take into consideration the changing legal environment and adapt accordingly by providing reasonable terms of use 
foreseeing the legal risks and concerns of the customers. Another tip which might be very useful for the cloud providers, and I highly recommend it, is to consider using external auditors and certification schemes. You need to provide sufficient guarantees to your customers in terms of expert knowledge, reliability, and resources to implement appropriate technical and organizational security measures in order to meet the requirements of the GDPR and protect the rights of the data subjects. The GDPR allows the cloud customer to conduct inspections and audits to ensure compliance. However, it also provides an alternative for the controller to mandate an external auditor, which I believe would be more appropriate. This is a more appropriate option for cloud provider, particularly one with a large customer base. The adherence to the processor to an approved certification mechanism may be used to help demonstrate compliance. Therefore, I think that it's worth considering the cloud certification schemes developed by the European Union Agency for Network and Information Security. We are waiting for proper guidance in terms of these legal requirements, but still, the use of external auditors and proper certification schemes should be on the radar of the cloud service providers. These alternatives may not entirely replace cloud customer due diligence, but will certainly facilitate the process and help both the cloud customers and the cloud service providers. Another tip is to ensure efficient procedures for the deletion of personal data. The cloud providers must make sure that the data is not copied and located in multiple places. You should create mechanisms in order to evaluate where the data is and to ensure that the data has been deleted when required. Under the GDPR, the processor must, at the choice of the controller, delete or return all the personal data to the controller after the end of the provision of the services relating to the processing and delete all existing copies. Under the European Union or the member state law requires storage of personal data, this might change. Otherwise, your customers would request from you such deletion of data and they might request also an inspection to review compliance with these requirements. Another tip is to engage the processors only with the prior written authorization of your customers. You can get specific or general written authorization, but if you are contracting on your standard terms of use, general written authorization for engaging the processors may be a more practical solution. Even if you have a general consent to subcontract, you must inform your relevant customer before adding or replacing subprocessors in order to give them with the opportunity to object to such changes. This is very important for cloud customers because they need to know where their data is located. You need to make sure that you conclude appropriate agreements with your subprocessors that impose the same obligations on them as those you have signed up to your customer agreements. And last but not least, you should consider the multi-jurisdiction issue. Make sure that you control where the personal data is located and who has access to it. Use appropriate transfer mechanisms, for example, model clauses, if personal data is transferred to a country outside of the European economic area. The transfer of personal data outside of the European economic area is a very sensitive topic at the moment, especially when the transfer is to the United States, and I think that this trend is likely to continue. The Snowden revelation, the invalidation of safe harbor, the controversy surrounding the proposed privacy shield had major impact on cloud service providers given that U.S. companies are the market leaders in this field. This is in part responsible for the increasing popularity of data localization as it is evident from recent developments in Russia, for example, and even in the European Union, such as France, with the French Digital Bill, both being in favor of measures to keep the data of their citizens within safe borders. Cloud customers have been forced to pay more attention to where the data is going, and you will need to provide sufficient guarantees that their personal data is being transferred outside of the European economic area in a lawful manner. I would leave to Thanos uh, to tell us a little bit more how is the situation in Germany. But in any case, I would like to mention once again 
that perhaps the most important factor in ensuring that the legal requirements for keeping personal data in the cloud do not create a barrier to what is technically possible is ensuring cooperation between cloud customers and cloud providers. And with this, I would like to say hi to Thanos, and I hope that he would be able to tell us a little bit more about the situation in Germany and the controller processor issues. Yes, thank you very much, um, Milena. Thank you all for listening in. Um, I, as uh, Sally said, I am a salary partner with TLOS Things Munich office, and I advise clients often on data processor agreements, and uh, I would like to give you some background on what um, your businesses who are located in Germany will face in terms of a gap analysis. I'm actually so excited that I'm missing the Germany game to tell you about this. So I hope you are as excited as I am to hear about it. So as uh, Debbie pointed out beforehand, um, German law is probably one of the strictest already when it comes to the relationship between a data controller and a data processor. And the reason is that um, from 2009 already we had a reformation of the German data protection law which um, stipulated that data processor agreements are required when um, outsourcing something to a data processor. So um, what does this mean? As probably many of you know, um, this means that you have to enter into a written agreement and um, this written agreement has to be in a certain format, um, has to be actually signed um, in writing and has to have certain aspects uh, within it. And if you don't have that agreement, uh, fines can be issued by the data protection regulator. For example, only past year, the data protection regulatory of Bavaria, which is actually known to be quite industry friendly, issued a five digit fine for, to a cloud computing uh, provider that did not have such an agreement. So moving on to the next slide, I would like to um, just give you a brief overview of what these agreements um, currently actually have to include. And then on the next slide, I will show you in um, the sense of a gap analysis what um, you will have to do under the GDPR to be compliant. There will be some um, aspects that uh, go beyond uh, what is currently in German data process agreements but there is also some stuff that is good under the GDPR regime, at least from a German uh, data protection law perspective. So currently we do have, as I said before, the requirement to provide for a data processor agreement in writing. And when we do that, we have to define exactly what the scope and the extent of the processing of personal data will look like. So um, what we usually do is similar to the EC model clauses, is to provide in some sort of annex what kind of personal data are touched uh, when outsourcing a task to a data processor and um, to what extent the data processor shall um, process this data. This is sort of similar to what will be required under the EU's um, reformation of data protection law. Further to that, under German law now, we need to impo impose certain security obligations, meaning that usually by way of another annex, we uh, provide for certain technical and organizational measures that um, uh, the data controller places onto the data processor. And these measures have always to be uh, very specific to the degree that they can be audited because another requirement is that an audit right is granted to the data controller. And the data controller can then, um, within a reasonable time frame, go and audit the processor and how the processor is protecting actually the personal data from unauthorized access, for example. Furthermore, we need to provide for a notification obligation, which means that if something goes wrong, for example, a data breach, the data processor shall inform the data controller as soon as possible so that the data controller can take the appropriate measures. And finally, what we also have in current data process agreements, at least if they're compliant with German law, is that we have to agree upon the use of subcontractors, meaning that um, we have to have some degree of um, uh, level of detail which provides how subcontractors may be used, either up on um, consent of the data controller or just by mere notification. And uh, last but not least, something else we provide for is the support of the data controller 
um, for the com uh, for compliance with uh, formal requirements under the German data protection laws, which means that um, when you need to draft a so-called process overview that details out all the relevant processing um, and systems that you are using as a data controller, the data processor shall actually help you with this. And moving on to the next slide, what is going to be different under the GDPR? So the GDPR provides for a similar sort of regime and a similar sort of idea in terms of data process agreements, as I said before, but it will require some changes. So in terms of a very short and brief overview, in terms of a gap analysis, I, we can say the following. The first of all is the um, the data processor shall assist the controller regarding security measures. Now this is different because as I said before, um, for the time being, as a data controller, you have to stipulate the technical and organizational measures that apply to the data processor. The GPR now will take a slightly different approach and will actually place the burden of de determining whether or not something is secure also on the processor. And this is something that you would need to reflect also in data processor agreements because I'm assuming that most agreements now should look differently. Secondly, the data processor shall provide information to the controller necessary for demonstrating compliance. This is somewhat similar to what I said before about the notification obligation. However, I think that the GDPR places more emphasis on this aspect and therefore I assume that uh, an amendment of con um, controller processor agreements will be required. Finally, mm, the processor will uh, be required to assist the data controller with audits, which means that um, as opposed to now, where as a controller you can just walk into a data processor's facilities and audit him in theory, um, there will be a further need for assistance. And last but not least, the processor needs to control uh, needs the controller's written, uh, prior written consent for any subcontracting is something that goes beyond the scope of the current agreement because, as I said before, there is the requirement to agree upon how subcontractors may be used, but now actually there is a necessity to have this by way of prior written consent. So this is something that would need to go into a data process agreement and is probably not covered in there as of now. Now to my last slide, um, before I hand over to Sally, um, what is going to be better for businesses in Germany due to the GDPR? Not everything is going to be bad, although as we saw before, some changes will be required. However, um, unlike the current requirement in Germany, where you have to have an agreement in writing, the GDPR will allow for data process agreements to be signed in electronic form, which is good because, especially with regard to cloud computing services that Milena talked about, it's certainly not helpful to have a signature on paper. Rather, this will uh, promote online agreements more and will also be good for proving compliance to the regulators. Secondly, the GDPR will be better because it will recognize that certifications may be used as a means of proving compliance. So far, the German regulators accept certifications. However, there is no clear guidance and no, no defined standard on how these certifications may look like. And this will make, I think, um, the practical aspects of promoting a service as a data processor in Germany easier and better for businesses. And finally, the EU Commission will recognize the EC model clauses as appropriate data processor agreements, or at least it could, which means that um, they can be used for data transfers within the EU also. This is currently something that we actually cannot do. Furthermore, under German law, as the situation is now, the data uh, protection authorities, the regulators, actually require, in addition to EC model clauses when transferring data outside the EU, that another supplemental agreement or an additional clause is inserted because they see that the German law provides for more requirements than actually the EC model clauses do. So if the EU Commission would recognize the EC model clauses as appropriate data process agreements, that would mean that we wouldn't need these additional supplemental agreements anymore. <laughs>
that is it from my side. So I'm handing over to Sally for the polling questions. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Thanos. And as he mentioned, we're now uh, reached that point in the webinar where we seek your direct feedback on some polling questions uh, to try and get a, a sense around some of the um, issues that are facing our attendees or levels of preparedness for uh, compliance. So I'm going to step us through three polling questions. And the first of those is, uh, if you're a processor, whether you have initiated your program to upscale your compliance to the General Data Protection Regulation, the GDPR. And there are three options here. So yes, you've uh, started a, a compliance program to uh, uh, incorporate the uh, higher uh, requirements of, for compliance under the GDPR. Uh, the, not yet, but that's imminent. Perhaps you're waiting on the outcome of the referendum later this week. Uh, or C, uh, you have no defined plans or program in place at the moment. And then the second question. So this is whether you're a controller or a processor. Are you already GDPR proofing your processing agreements with your processors and clients? Again. Yes, this is an exercise that you're already undertaking. Not at the moment, but you anticipate starting that process in the next six months. Or no, you're just simply keeping the issue under review at this point in time. And then we have the third of the polling questions, which is, again, as a processor this time, if as a processor, um, how successful is your flowing down of your current client contractual data processing obligations to your sub-processors. So do you flow down obligations successfully for all of your sub-processors? Do you find that there's a small number of sub-processors who refuse to cooperate with uh, any flow down of measures that are imposed upon you by your end client? Are there a significant number, in fact, who refuse to cooperate? Or do you not currently flow down any client contractual processing obligations to sub -processing? So uh, whilst those polling results are being churned and uh, we're just waiting for them to come through, we'll take a look at some of the questions that have come through. So first question um, we have is, as a data controller, what must we request to the data processor if they transfer or process data outside of the EEA? Um, so, as it, in the case uh, it was before, a data processor, in effect, um, didn't have any responsibility for uh, any data transfers that it uh, or any transfers to it uh, made by a data controller. So in effect, you could almost sort of sit on its hands and wait for a data controller to raise that issue uh, with it. Uh, whereas under the GDPR, uh, the processor also has a responsibility for um, determining if it's going to be transferring personal data. Uh, and so um, both parties, in effect, would need to, uh, for example, ensure that they're entering into uh, appropriate adequacy mechanisms for um, transfers. And it's worth noting in this respect that um, under the GDPR, where you've got uh, a, 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 a valid adequacy mechanism that is still valid at the at point the GDPR comes into force, then those decisions will carry forward. So things like on contract clauses, assuming that they are still valid at that point, um, uh, and uh, binding corporate rules uh, will uh, be, for example, uh, examples of mechanisms under which um, uh, adequacy may be um, uh, entered into. Uh, so um, the obligations around this transfer for the controller will not necessarily alter uh, significantly when dealing with the data processor, but certainly from the data processor's perspective, they now 
can't just simply wait for that issue to be presented to them by, by the data controller. Oh, and I think we now have our results back from the polling question. So, um, in terms of the first question, which was, as a processor, have you initiated your program to upscale your compliance to the GDPR? So, uh, in relation to question A, yes, we have started a program. 52% uh, of you have, uh, have uh, confirmed that that's the case. And then 36% um, are uh, saying that they are those pro that program is imminent. They are perhaps waiting on the outcome of the referendum. Um, and 12% uh, have, have yet to put a defined program in place. The second question, which they applied equally to controllers or processors, uh, was um, whether uh, you are GDPR proofing your processing agreements with your processors or, or, or your end clients. And again, here we have 50% um, of you uh, answered, answered positively to question, to question to point B, which was that you're planning to do so in the next six months. And then 33% of you are, uh, are not uh, currently proofing your processing agreements and are keeping the issue under review. And just 17% are currently ex are in the process of doing that proofing pro proofing exercise. So that's quite interesting. There's definitely a, uh, a tendency there amongst the responses to uh, uh, wait and see. And then we have question three, uh, which in relation to a processor, how successful is your flowing down of current client contractual data processing obligations to sub processors? And here we have 40% who have uh, indicated that flow down obligations are successful for sub processors. 25% say that a small number of sub processors refuse to cooperate. 30% uh, say that they're not currently flowing down client contractual processing obligations. And 5% have said that they have had problems with a significant number. Uh, of, of uh, sub processors who refuse to cooperate. So I think those are quite uh, quite interesting statistics, and it'll be interesting to see with the GDPR whether that statistic uh, uh, changes and whether sub processors are more prepared to uh, engage with that flow down, given that there's a more specific obligation for that flow down uh, to happen perhaps within within the GDPR. Okay, so. I'm conscious that we are now up against the end of our time, and there are some questions that have come through that um, we haven't been able to, to get to. There was quite an interesting question that came in uh, in relation to um, the impact of the processor obligations and liabilities under the GDPR uh, to the liability clauses to be included in the processor agreement. I, I actually think that the, the, the specific issue of sort of drafting of those agreements between controls and processes could potentially be the subject of a webinar in its own right, and one that perhaps we will take away and and uh, uh, and sort of think uh, plan for in, in a future webinar. Certainly, I think that perhaps the implications for controllers are likely to be similar to now. Um, although for processes, question whether in fact um, they might need to. Uh, um, have more in the way of the ability to get compensation potentially for perhaps any actions or, uh, or, or failure to act on the part of a controller that might create some liability. Um, but there's literally some, some feedback off the top of our head, and I think that certainly I think this is a subject that we could perhaps uh, look at in more detail across the agreement as a whole for a future webinar. So um, before we sign off, there were just a few points I wanted to uh, flag with you in terms of future events and webinars. So firstly, on the 7th of July, we have a breakfast seminar uh, which has a cyber focus. So it's going to be looking at issues, for example, such as practical lessons from um, data breaches for the last 12 months, what we can learn from those data breaches. Uh, it's also going to be looking at um, the topic of the, sort of the role of IT forensics in, in data breach investigation. Uh, if you're interested in that breakfast seminar, you can find details of how to register for that on our website.
then our next webinar is going to be on the 19th of July, and that is going to be looking at data privacy and defamation issues. Um, so the, perhaps the role of data protection in, 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 in defamation action. Um, and again, if you're interested in that event, you can find further details on our website. After the 19th of July, we're going to be taking our summer holiday from webinars and we'll be uh, putting further details of our autumn program uh, onto our website uh, closer to that time. Um, so that brings us to the end of the webinar today. Just to let you know, that as you sign off, you are going to be prompted to uh, give us a bit of feedback in a very short survey. If you do have an opportunity to uh, quickly feed, uh, provide us with that feedback, that would be very gratefully received and will help us to uh, make further improvements to our future webinars. Uh, and on that, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, I hope you have a good rest of the day and uh, we hope you join us for uh, our next webinar. Thank you.